I've recently finished this level here for my Nintendo 64 mod Return to Yoshi's Island and I've gotten a lot of mileage out of manipulating random matrices. Biobag helped me polish this up to make it look as good as it is and I'm pretty happy with the visuals and performance of this level. As usual, this whole level runs at minimum at 30 FPS on real Nintendo 64 as well, as you can see in the footage here despite all these expensive graphics and animations going on here. And this is even true if you activate this crazy screen distortion effect by touching the fuzzy. In fact, this effect costs less than 5 microseconds to render. Yes, microseconds, not milliseconds. A thousand times less. That sounds insane, but that's just how powerful render matrices are. Similarly, matrices help me render this faraway background here without running into insane z-buffer precision issues that would otherwise plague the Nintendo 64. And cause weird edges similar to what I'm showing in this GIF here. So let me show you how matrices help me create some really powerful, nearly free of performance cost visuals and permit me to draw geometry further away than usual. Okay, first of all, you may ask, what do matrices have to do with graphics at all? Well, quite a lot actually. In 3D rendering, matrices are important to find the position of any vertex on your screen for the final image output. All 3D N64 games work off of render matrices, and even modern Unreal Engine 5 does. So I'm going to assume that they have been there since the dawn of 3D rendering all the way until today. Usually, your 3D engine would handle all the matrix stuff for you, but if you take the time to understand them, it will be super worth it in the long run. Understanding how to use these lets you do borderline free of cost and interesting graphics effects such as 3D rendering in screen space, for example, UI elements like in Banjo Kazooie, screen distortion effects like this one, adding sheer to your 3D models. Or, if you're really good with random matrices, you can do much crazier effects, such as this whole planetary gravity concept that I'm currently working on. Mario 64 and most 3D Nintendo 64 games, for example, use them to animate their characters. Ever wondered why the limbs on the N64 are the separated worlds? It's because they are all individual models that are being moved around via model matrices. This lets them animate 3D models super cheap, much cheaper than modern animation techniques. Really? In my opinion, this technique should be the standard for large crowds of unimportant characters. I bet we could get rid of the cursed 5 FPS background and PCs that plague almost every modern game. Matrices sound kind of complicated at first, but they're actually pretty manageable. And I'll explain how they work and show you a few cool effects you can do with them to give you some motivation to play around with it yourself. The main reason 3D applications use matrices is that matrices are excellent at transforming coordinate systems. Take a look at this. In this animation here, you can see how a matrix can stretch, offset or rotate a coordinate system. This is the basis of all 3D rendering. Okay, so big deal, they can transform coordinate systems. Why would that help anything? Well, just imagine you have this scene here with a camera, a model and a transformation that you want to render the model at. In 3D rendering, the game needs to sum up figure out where each piece of the 3D model is going to be on your screen. We can do this by transforming the coordinate system three times. First, transform a mesh's coordinate system from its own space into the coordinate system of its transform. Let's say our transform is at the location 200, 1000 and 20 with a 90 degree rotation along the up axis and a scale of 2, which places it here. Next, transform the coordinate system from there into the world of the camera. This places the entire world relative to the camera's transform and now we can see what the camera sees. And then third, we just project the coordinate system from the camera relative world onto your 2D screen. This projection is what moves this from a 3D world onto 2D screen. It has parameters such as the field of view and even depth in it. Look what happens when we added those parameters. You've secretly already been looking at this projection happening all along because as far as I'm aware you are watching this on a 2D screen and this projection has to happen for me to even record any output here. There is no three dimensional output device after all as far as I'm aware. Really the goal here is to move every vertex of a mesh onto a fitting position on your screen and then the rest of the renderer can fill the space between vertices with triangles. All we care about with these render matrices is where the vertices end up. Now that we have a high level overview, let's first understand how a model matrix works. 
This is the main one you will be manipulating if you want to implement cool effects. We'll use this Mario Cube of size 200 as an example model. Matrix multiplication works by multiplying a matrix with a vertex vector with the number 1 appended at the end of it. So one of the vertices on our Mario Cube will be positioned at 200, 0, 200. This would be at the bottom left vertex near the camera here. So if you have a matrix with just a diagonal 1 entry, you get back the initial vertex position. This is called an identity matrix. Right here in game, I have the Mario Cube and I'm rendering it with the matrix I am showing on the bottom of the screen. So you can see in real time how editing the matrix changes the model. If we were to scale the diagonal up to 2, you'd get twice the vertex position back and the model would be scaled up by a factor of 2. We call this a scale matrix. Imagine, for example, if we apply the scale matrix to every vertex of a cube. All the vertex would move out from the origin and our cube would now be double the size. Another simple matrix is the translation matrix. For the translation matrix, we just set the last column to however much we want to translate our vertex. Because we appended 1 to our vertex at the end, the output will be exactly our previous vertex, translated by a few units. In the cube example, this would be just the cube shifted sideways. The last important matrix is the shear matrix. This one is a bit more complicated, but by filling out one of these spots here, we can cause our cube to be scooted. A simple example of it would be to fill in this spot to increase the X position depending on how far the Y position of the vertex is. This is a very rarely used effect, but it has some uses. Of course, we also need to be able to rotate 3D models. This is done via something called a rotation matrix. These are basically just shears that preserve overall volume. A rotation matrix typically looks like this. This is really nice animation by Stand Up Math that shows how a rotation matrix is really just multiple shears combined. I think this makes it pretty intuitively clear how a rotation matrix works. And one really cool thing about matrices is that you can multiply all the different kinds of matrices together to apply all the transformations at the same time. So once you've gathered your scale matrix, your rotation matrix and your translation matrix, you can just multiply them together and then apply them to your model and it will apply the entire transformation to it. Not every functionality is supported in most 3D software. So if you want, for example, a shear effect, you will need to implement it in code. Whatever engine you use, I'm sure it will have functionality to do this. In Unreal Engine 5, for example, you can override the get render matrix function to affect it directly and use the shear effect. There's also some dark magic messed up stuff you can do with these four values at the end here. You may notice that I did not mention these at all. That is because their effects are so weird that I have not found a reasonable use for it. They are used for perspective division near the end of rendering only. Here's an example of what happens when you added them that Death Wizard made. All right. Glad that's explained. No more hard math for the rest of the video, I promise. Now that we are done with the render matrix, let's talk about the The view matrix does exactly what the model matrix did. It just transforms the world space into the camera space, effectively rotating the entire world with your camera's viewpoint. For an example use case, I've used the view matrix effect here to make it look as though the ship was swaying back and forth, when in reality, it is just a camera. The principles here are the same as they were in the model matrix, so there really isn't much to explain. It's just noteworthy that editing this one here is also doable. And lastly, we just need a projection matrix. A projection is what determines how 3D elements are being displayed on your 2D screen. This matrix holds info about stuff like field of view or focal length, and will ultimately put the vertex coordinates into a state from where the renderer can draw them onto the screen. One cool use case I have is for this Mario is tripping type effect, and it is essentially 100% free of cost. You'd usually use some kind of post-processing effect for this, I guess. It looks extremely trippy, and it does not cause any additional math at all for the pixels, since we are just tweaking the numbers for a matrix multiplication that was going to happen anyway. There are many cool things you can do with render matrices. Knowing that all three of these are being multiplied with each other, you could, for example, multiply your render matrix with the inverse of the projection matrix and another projection matrix to render just one mesh with a different clip plane or field of view or whatever. This is very commonly used in shooter games actually, to render a held weapon with a different FOV than the rest of the game. Another really common trick is to move the model matrix with the camera. This is done in games like Ocarina of Time to render the backgrounds. They are really small and really close to the camera in reality, but they look like they're so far away. 
And it's a trick similar to how my background here works. The N64 cannot actually render geometry this far away without serious Z buffer precision issues at near ranges. I simply render it pretty close and with no depth, so it always renders first and I then draw everything else over it. I can then just hide the fact that it's a background by making sure the colors at the edge of my actual level model that renders above it blend into the background mesh. Do you see the edge of the oily water here? That's the real furthest part of the level model. Everything after that is merely an illusion. The shear can be used to great effect too. I'm using it here on my flames to make them wobble around a bit and added their volume without having to give them full on vertex animations. It's a lot cheaper and it looks decent. As always, a shout out to all my Patreons. I've now finished 12 out of the 15 levels in Return to Yoshi's Island, so we're getting closer and closer to completion. Please understand that I do want to polish this game up as much as possible before release, so it's still a while out. Either way, I hope you continue supporting this channel and I will do my best to deliver a good game to show my appreciation. I was actually thinking of releasing another demo with just the first course, so people can give me feedback on Mario and the camera, so we can make sure the full game will be of smooth experience for everyone. Let me know what you think and I'll see ya.